your feet. I felt like we should have stood up the whole time and just clapped at a bomb, 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 bomb. How many of you were having some 80s flashbacks? Yes, a couple raised their hands. Awesome. Well, put your Bible over your head. Lord, <coughs> amen. We invite you into this place today, into this teaching, into our hearts, all the things. Holy Spirit, bring these words to life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, forgive me, that was rude. I have a cold. I've heard lots of people have colds and all the crud. And so I'm not sure if they gave it to me or if I gave it to them. But it'll all wash out in the end, I'm sure. Right? Let me give you the title for the message this weekend. Pass the torch. Pass the torch. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. While we're turning there, I want to remind you that last year, 2023, the prophetic word or the theme for the year was live the life. And so in January of 2023, we started a chronological journey through the four Gospels. We committed to look at the events in Jesus' life and the order in which they would have happened, hoping, uh, hoping that studying his life will help us to live the life that he's called us to live. Amen? Amen? How many of you know there's a lot of stuff that happened in Jesus' life? There's a lot of stuff. And because of that, we were not able to get through the four Gospels in 2023. And so we've carried this chronological journey into 2024. We do have a new word for the year, theme for the year, and that is all in. But we're on the same journey. Now, here's what's crazy. We only have two more weeks left of our chronological journey through the four Gospels. Isn't that crazy? Two more weeks, this week and next week. And these last two weeks, we're going to look at the last two things that Jesus says. And it's not surprising that the last two things that Jesus says are 100% connected to everything else he's already said and to what he's already done. Okay, And, And like we said, he has done a lot. In John chapter 21, John says, there are many more things that Jesus did. If all of them were written down, I suppose, not even the world itself would have enough space for the books that could be written. There's a lot of stuff that Jesus did, so obviously we can't cover it all. It would take, I wonder how long it would take. It would probably take three or four years, honestly, to go just lick by lick through the Gospels, every teaching, every miracle, right? It would take a while. I feel like we've done a good job. In fact, if you go back to 2022 in our podcasts, our teachings, 2022, we went all the way through the Old Testament. We basically have a video survey of the Old Testament. 2023, live the life. We have the first part of the Gospels. And then now at the end of 2024, we will have a working New Testament survey of at least the four Gospels and maybe as much of Acts as we can possibly get. Okay, that's a lot. You know what this is, a, uh, this is for us? It's a great discipleship tool. It's a great discipleship tool. I talk to people all the time. I just I don't really know the word. I didn't grow up in church, and that was my story. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know anything. I was starting from scratch. What's awesome is we don't have to start from scratch. When you're discipling someone, you don't have to start from scratch. You say, hey, let's catch up. You can learn the whole Old Testament, basically, in a year. You can get through the Gospels in a year and a half or so, right? Isn't that cool? Yes. Okay. Speaking of discipleship, okay, let's dive in. Matthew chapter 28. Remember the title for the message is Pass the Torch. And here's this whole sermon in one sentence. If we don't make disciples, our own flame will eventually die out. That's going to make more sense as we go, but let me say it again. If we don't make disciples... Our own flame will eventually die out, okay? So the second 
to the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. It says that Jesus, is in Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, says Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now that is a pass the torch statement if I ever heard one, right? Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Therefore, you go. The implication is that Jesus had something in his hands that he was now placing into the hands of his disciples. There's something that Jesus was responsible to carry that now he's, rep- he's placing that responsibility into the hands of those who follow him. He is passing the torch. We all know what passing the torch means, right? Does everybody understand what that means? Let me give you a working definition. Passing the torch means to transfer the responsibility of a thing over to someone else. That phrase actually comes from the Olympics. The 2024 Olympics start in July. Is anybody other than me excited about that? I, love, I don't know what your favorite event is. I know this is weird, but my favorite event is actually gymnastics. The way people can run and jump and, and, and swing around on bars and stuff is like, that's all my wildest dreams coming to true in one whole setting. You know what I'm saying? It's amazing. How does the Olympics start? That's right. An athlete holding a torch runs down and through the stadium and lights the massive Olympic fire. And that fire stays lit throughout the entire games. My favorite was 1996, the Atlanta, Georgia Olympics, when Muhammad Ali lit the Olympic fire. Four-time Olympic gold medalist Al Order was the first to carry the torch into Atlanta Stadium. There, he handed it to hometown hero Evander Holyfield. Holyfield sprinted around the track with Greek athlete Vula Petuladou before handing the torch to American swimming champion Janet Evans. Finally, as Evans ran up the staircase to the strains of Beethoven's Ode to Joy, Muhammad Ali stepped out from the shadows. But look who gets it next. The greatest. Oh, my! And the response he evokes is part affection, part excitement, but especially respect. What a moment. Muhammad Ali, of course, an Olympian, as young Cassius Clay, gold medal boxer, 1960, the Games of Rome. To become arguably the most famous person on this earth. Man, that clip gets me every time. And you guys know Muhammad Ali um, was there. He was Parkinson's and he was shaking. And so obviously he couldn't run, but he was able to light that very last leg, moved every time. Now, listen, we all know Muhammad Ali was a mess. All right. But that dude could box. And that's, that's, that's not all that counts, but it sure was important to me when I was watching him. You know. Anyway. Did you notice that it wasn't just one man carrying that torch? In fact, for the 1996 Olympics, 12,467 people carried the torch from Olympia, Greece, all the way to Atlanta, Georgia. They started on April 27th, and Muhammad Ali, he lit the Olympic fire on July 19th, 1996. It's amazing, isn't it? And this whole tradition originated with the Greek Olympic Games that started in seven, uh, 776 BC. Okay, a long time ago. And the entire games back then started 
with a relay race between nations. This relay race was called the Lampa Lampa de, Lampa Lampa de Dra- It's a really long word starting with L. You can look it up. Four runners would race with a torch to a finish line. Okay, the first runner would pass the torch to the second, and he to the third, and the third passed the torch to the fourth runner. And whichever team passed the torch over the finish line first, with the flame still lit, okay, the, the team would be disqualified if their flame went out, okay? You had to cross the finish line with your flame lit. The first team across the finish line with their flame lit was granted the honor of relighting that Olympics sacred fire. And every member of the team was considered uh, equally honorable because of their effort that they put into it. They all, the whole team, received the glory for that victory. Inside the games, once the games started, one of the events was a single person, long distance race where the runner would carry the torch the entire way. Okay. But it was the exact same rules. The runner who crossed the finish line first with his torch still lit is the one who won the race. Why don't you listen? The flame had to stay lit. I mean, I could drop the mic. We can just go home. Because y'all are a smart group of people, and y'all have already picked up what I'm laying down. Right? The flame had to stay lit. Remember, you only win if the flame stays lit. You could cross that finish line. A runner in the games, a torch in hand, could cross the finish line. But if there is no flame, there is no victory. And listen, the games at that time in history were a big deal. And they were held all over the place in that region of the world. Paul was in the city of Corinth right around the time they hosted one of the Olympics, when the Corinth hosted the Olympics. I think it was like 56 AD or something like that. It's, it's documented. And he probably thought, well, thousands of people who don't know Jesus... That sounds like the place to be. <laughs> you know he was there, front row, cheering people on, leading people to Jesus. In his letters, he was constantly referring to the games. Think about what he wrote to the, the Corinthians. First Corinthians 9, he says, Do you not know that in a race, that word for race is stadion? Y'all listen. That word for race there, he says, do you not know that in a race, that word there in the original Greek is the word for racetrack. Okay, but it was also the word used for a unit of measurement. A stadion was about 600 feet. It was about 185 meters, which just happens to be the space size of an Olympic, um, one of the ancient Olympic stadiums, stadiums back then. A stadion. Isn't that cool? What's Paul referring to? He says, do you not know that all run in a race? He's he's referring to the Olympic Games, 100%. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable. So I do not run. Aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I strictly discipline my body. You guys remember the old, I buffet my body, right? Y'all thought it was buffet? Totally different, (laughs) totally different meaning. I buffet my body, like most of us are doing. But I strictly discipline, I buffet my body. I discipline my body. Some translations say, Paul says, I beat my body and I make it come under submission to me. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul was constantly referring to the games. Philippians chapter 3, he says, I'm not perfect in my pursuit of Jesus. I love that he wasn't arrogant. He says, I'm not perfect in my pursuit of Jesus, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind 
and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize. That's an Olympic reference. But he's using it in context to encourage these people. He says, I, I do it for the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Makes me think of... Um, of coming around that final curve at the end of a mile race. I ran the mile when I was in high school. My son just ran. He just won third. He got third at state in his track meet. You know what, last weekend? Yeah, he did good. That's right. Listen, and he ran. He, what did you have, the flu? He had something. He was like, oh, my God, but he ran. And if he hadn't have been, because of what we know about times, he either would have won or come very, very, very close second. But he was sick. He was amazing. He got third. So love you, bud. You're my greatest fan. <laughs> See what I did there? No, I'm just kidding. I'm your greatest fan. But it makes me, it makes me think of coming around that, that final curve. You, you've run three and a half laps. Maybe you didn't even run all the laps perfectly. You haven't ran the race perfectly per your strategy that you had in mind, but that didn't matter. I forget about all that. Paul says, I forget about all that. It's time to kick. It's time to strain forward to what lies ahead. And the finish line is the only thing that matters. That finish line is only a stadion away, just 600 feet or so away. And that's what I'm pressing on to the goal for the prize. Amen. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's passing the torch to his disciple, Timothy. And he says, train yourself in godliness. For while physical training is of some value, what's he talking about? Olympic athletes. The apostle Paul watched the Olympics every four years. And that was the amount of time it was back then, every four years. In fact, it was a, it was a measurement of time. The way we would say a decade or whatever, they would say an Olympia. Olympia or Olympian or something, meaning every four years. So you know Paul is into it. He's referring to that. Timothy, train yourself in godliness. Physical training is of some value. Godliness is even more valuable in every way, holding promise to both the present life and the life to come. Paul is saying, put time and energy into your spiritual growth. Don't get lazy. Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul's passing the torch to Timothy. And he says, in the case of an athlete, Paul just couldn't get, he was always talking about sports, like Pastor Marvin, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Roger, have you noticed Roger's got a thing about sports, right? And Joe does too. We all do, I guess. But Paul certainly did. He says, in the case of an athlete, let's talk sports. No one is crowned without competing according to the rules. Now, it seems like Paul's favorite two events were boxing and running, which are my, I love those, boxing and running, okay? I also like gymnastics. I already told you that. But there ain't nothing like seeing somebody get punched in the face. I'm just saying. <laughs> by the way, by the way, and this is why you're not going to see a ton of pictures in this sermon, the athletes competed naked. All the, somebody said, oh, yeah. You've seen those pictures, huh? <laughs> you know why I'm not showing them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, the athletes, all the events, all the events, the running, the wrestling, the boxing, all the things, all the things. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Anyway, listen, the boxing rules, there were, there were only two rules in the Olympic boxing, in the ancient Olympics. Two rules. No gouging of eyes and no kicking in the growing, which I'm sure was kind of hard to do. You know, something happened, at least by accident, you know what I'm saying? But those were the two rules in boxing. Listen, you couldn't gouge people in the eyes and you couldn't kick them in the growing or punch them in the growing, okay? Really, the one rule... For the running event was the flame on your torch had to stay lit. What is the Apostle Paul teaching Timothy? He says, he's saying, be kind, be fair, be considerate, be compassionate. Don't, be, don't kick people in the growing. Timothy, that's not, that's not good for him, bro. Right? 
Again, he's, he's passing the torch, teaching him how to, do, how, how to live this thing. Be kind. Be considerate. Be compassionate. With this running thing, what is he teaching people? He's saying, Timothy, you've got to keep your torch lit. You've got to keep your torch lit. In fact, in the previous chapter, chapter 1, for 2 Timothy chapter 1, he literally tells Timothy to fan into flame the gift that was given to him. Y'all, listen. One of the last things that Paul says before he dies, okay? This is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He knew, he knew he was on his deathbed, okay? And we all know what his next statement is. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And in the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, I want you to think about what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, I have fought the good fight. Remember, before Christ, Paul killed Christians. He's saying, I've done my very best to love people well, to display the fruits of the Spirit, to be um, loving and joyful and kind, gentle, patient, to have self-control, all the fruits of the Spirit. How many of y'all know it's hard to fight the good fight? It's hard to fight the hard. It's hard to play by the rules. Y'all, I, I have kind of a surly past. And it's a daily struggle to have self-control because sometimes you do just want to gouge people in the eye. Am I wrong? Sometimes you just want to haul off and kick them in the groin. <laughs> That's what they deserve, but you just can't do it, right? He says, I have fought the good fight. And then he says, listen, I have finished the race. Paul had run his race. And he knows that he's about to cross the finish line. He's about to die. His life on earth was about to be over and his life with Jesus in eternity was about to begin. What is he saying? He's saying, I never gave up. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I never gave up. Even when things were hard, even when I had nothing else to give, I pressed on towards the goal to win the prize of the Upward calling in Christ Jesus, right? But listen, Paul knew. He knew that it's not enough to just cross the finish line. So what does he say? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I, I crossed the finish line. But I've also kept the faith. What is he referring to? The Olympic rule for running the race. Your torch has to be lit. Are you with me, saints? I've kept the faith. My flame has been lit. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7? He said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. But I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me. Let me say it this way. Many will cross the finish line and say, here's my torch. And Jesus will say to them, I don't see no flame. Paul says, in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed. Your translation may say have loved his appearing. Paul is passing the torch. He's teaching his number one disciple, Timothy, what it takes to win the prize. To hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Are you with me? But listen, even more than teaching Timothy, Paul was obeying Jesus. Obeying what? 
Remember, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples. The apostle Paul had made more disciples than anyone else mentioned in the Bible. And there is evidence that his disciples went on to make even more disciples. Paul passed the torch and taught people how to pass the torch. Again, all of which was in obedience to Jesus. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And this is what the Apostle Paul devoted his entire life to, making disciples. In fact, I believe that Paul's confidence that he would receive the crown of righteousness had less to do with his actual righteousness and more to do with knowing that he obeyed Jesus' command to go and make disciples. That's not to say that Paul wasn't righteous. I believe that Paul walked with integrity. He had purity of heart, which is probably why he was so successful at passing the torch. You hear me? My point is, is that we forget that making disciples is a command. Making disciples is not a suggestion. It was a command of our Lord. And it's one that 90%, easily 90% of Christians are not obeying. We're fighting the fight in other ways. We're working on being better people. We're working hard to obey the Ten Commandments. But most Christians put little to no effort in passing the torch, making disciples and teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded them. There's a room full of people tonight. Let me ask you, are you making disciples? Are you passing the torch? Because Jesus wants you to. Jesus has commanded you to. I mean, it makes sense that the only thing that Jesus calls us that he also calls himself is light. You ever thought about that? I've shared that before. We have a whole series that we do on the light around Christmas time when we talk about the menorah. So this isn't new to some of you, but to some of you it is. So let me say it again. The only thing that Jesus call, the only thing that Jesus calls us that he also calls himself is light. John 8, Jesus spoke to his disciples and he says, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In Matthew chapter 5, this is a sermon on the mount. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that we are light in the same way that Jesus is light, okay? We are not and we will never be little gods. Okay, that's a, that's a weird teaching that people believe. It's cray-cray. Okay, it's not true. John chapter 1 talks about how John the Baptist, he says, John the Baptist, he says, I'm not the light. John the Baptist came, but he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Okay, so we're not the light. We're not the light. Jesus, it goes on in John 1, it says, Jesus is the true light. I love that distinction. Jesus is the true light who gives light to every man. You see how that works? Psalm chapter 27 and verse 1 helps us with this. It says that the Lord is my light 
and my salvation. When Jesus says, you are the light of the world, he, he is saying, you are a torch that carries me. Jesus is the fire. You say that out loud? Come on, say it like you mean it. Jesus is the fire, and we are the torches who carry that fire. Without Jesus, I'm just a torch. Isn't that right? Without Jesus, we're just torches. Without the light, I'm going to lose my way. With the light, I can find my way. Amen. I can help others find their way, which is the point. All I have to do is expose their life to his light. Are y'all seeing how this works? He says, you are the light of the world. Let's look at it again. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand and it gives light to everyone. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. A major problem that we have in the church is that we have made this um, let your light shine concept apply only to evangelism, winning souls, bringing people to Jesus. And that's where we've missed Jesus's point in Matthew chapter 28. He doesn't say go and win souls. It's just not what he says. He says, go and make disciples. He says, you teach them everything that I have commanded you. Should we evangelize? Of course. Should we be intentional about spreading the gospel? Yeah, obviously, of course. But that's the easy part. Because I can do that from outside the trench. You guys know what I'm talking about? The hard part is when someone receives the truth, they surrender their life to Jesus because now I got to get down into that trench and I got to help them get out of that trench, teach them how to live this new life that they have found in Christ Jesus. And how many of you know that's a lot of work? Y'all remember the people that got in the trench for you? You don't know how much you put them through. (laughs) Or maybe you do. And that's why you won't get in the trench for others. Jesus calls this disciple making, passing the torch. Let me start winding this down. Let me say what I said at the the beginning. If we don't pass the torch, then our own flame will eventually die out. It's just the way it works. It's funny how concerned the church has become with the current condition of the younger generation. And by concerned, what I really mean is how full of frustration and complaints that we have. God, kids these days. Why can't they just... Why won't they just... Fill in the blank, right? And we judge them. How could anybody ever? But if we were honest enough to admit it, we would admit that what we are dealing with, we're dealing with it because we haven't done a great job of passing the torch. It's just the fact. And has anyone noticed that these issues aren't just young people issues anymore. The older generations have started slipping into the same patterns of thinking and behavior. Why is that? Because when we don't pass the torch, our own flame will eventually die out. And we have our excuses for why we're not passing the torch, why we're not making disciples. Well, I just don't have time. I've heard it all. I don't really know enough to disciple someone. I don't know who I should be discipling. It even gets into the realm of insecurities like, what if they don't listen to me? 
What do we say here at Selma Church? You've heard me say this dozens of times. A reason can be for a season. But an excuse will become your noose. A reason can be for a season. There are seasons where it's just harder to do as much. Our context and our, um, um, you know, our abilities are just is they're limited during seasons. So a reason can be for a season. But an excuse after excuse after excuse will become your noose. When we don't pass the torch and we got all of our excuses for it, what happens? Our flame eventually dies out. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Think about what he's saying. When we go with the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, there's always enough time. There's always enough energy and capacity to make disciples. Isn't that right? Which is what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the very last thing Jesus said, go, but don't go until you have been endued with power from on high. We're going to talk about that next week. Okay. Bottom line, Jesus wouldn't command us to do something and not give us the ability to do it. Is that right? Saints. Amen. Okay. Again, you're a smart group of people. I know that you understand what I'm saying this weekend. Let me end with something practical. Okay, you want to write this down. Let me give you 10 ways to pass the torch. 10 ways to pass the torch. Number one, keep your own torch lit. Keep your own torch lit. And, and there's subcategories under that. Be a person of prayer. Worship Jesus personally, not just corporately. Get into the word Read it, study it, memorize it, share it. Become a person who consistently fasts and prays. All the spiritual disciplines, you understand? You keep your torch lit. Number two, let your light shine. Keep your torch lit and raise it up. Let your light shine. Actually live the life that Jesus has called you to live. Hypocrisy ain't going to disciple nobody. Well, I guess it will. Deci uh, 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 hypocrisy begets hypocrisy. So I guess it will. So I guess you have to ask yourself, what kind of disciples I want to make? We will make good ones. Let your light shine in such a way. Number three, get involved in a church. I know you guys are here and Soma is your church. So, but you may be here and you're just visiting and you're looking for a church. Soma may in the end, it may not be your church. That's okay. But you hope you find one. And when you do, get involved in that church. Listen, <laughs> church is where the people who need discipleship hang out. Isn't that right? It always amazes me, people that are like anti-church. Well, I don't, I don't go to church. I just be the church. It's like, first of all, that is lame. <laughs> but then by saying that, like you're disregarding all the things. Anyway, I don't get me started on that. <laughs> Number four, ask God who. Ask God who, Lord. Direct me to someone who needs discipleship. Ask God who. When he shows you, invite them to lunch. Or breakfast. Or brunch. Or dinner. If you're like me, take advantage of all those. <laughs> and if you can get them to pay, man, you're set. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know I'm kidding. Most of you know I always reach for the ticket. So... Anyway, invite them to lunch. And again, it doesn't have to be lunch, but like make it to where you are able to be with them across the table. I love this. Preaching is fun and I love sharing the word in this way. But my favorite thing is sitting across a coffee shop table or a lunch table talking with someone, just talking with someone. What do you do when you get there? Well, ask them questions. Number six, 
Just ask them questions. Get to know their life. Get to know the context. Get to know the areas where they need a little more Holy Spirit, where they need a little more um, juice in the fruits, you know, juicy fruits of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> ask them questions. Listen to me, guys. You know what one of the worst things ever is to have? I'm, I'm just going to be real with you. I'm, I'm going to be real with you, okay? One of the worst things in the world is to have a whole lunch time with somebody. And they talk the whole time, and they never ask you anything about yourself. They never ask you anything. You've asked them all the questions, and you should ask them all the questions. That's good. But they never ask you a single thing. If you are that person, I want to ask you to repent and get saved. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I know that me is my favorite subject, just like you is your favorite subject. But y'all, come on. Ask them questions. That meeting isn't about you, except for the moments where it's about you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I just totally came off the stage. Y'all see that? <laughs> Darn near pulled something too. <laughs> I, need to, I need to buffet my body a little bit more instead of buffeting it. <laughs> Number seven, share your story. Ask them questions, share your story. Now remember, not the whole time, don't be talking the whole time, but share your story. What has God done in your life? Amen? Share your story. Be willing to be vulnerable. It's like, oh, I don't want them to know that. Why? God redeemed you. Yeah, you may, may time release some of the stuff. You know, I'm not going to tell everybody everything right off. But if I get close enough to someone that I feel like I can trust them, I will. But I have a lot that God's done in my life that I can trust anybody with. Isn't that right? I don't have to like completely pull out the stuff in the closet. I can just open the door a little bit. It's like, you see that mess, right? <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? Share your stories. Number eight, open your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. Crazy to have a discipleship type meeting. <laughs> you don't bring your Bible. Well, I got my phone. Bring your Bible. <laughs> bring your Bible. I'm just convinced if Jesus didn't use an iPhone to train his disciples, then we shouldn't either. You hear what I'm saying? Technically, Jesus didn't walk around with a Bible either because he knew it. It was imprinted on his heart. Now, granted, he wrote it, so he's got to step ahead of all of us. But you guys hear what I'm saying. Open your Bibles. You're with me, right? Okay. Number nine, do life together. Not everything has to be spiritual. It's true. Not everything has to be spiritual. Go play golf. I don't know why you want to play golf, but go play golf. <laughs> go fishing. Go for a run. Go for a hike. Go watch a movie. Amen? Amen. Do life together. And number 10, encourage them to do the same. Encourage them to pass the torch. And by doing these things, you will literally be doing what Jesus did. Amen.